my name is Cheryl Erickson and I'm the Indigenous Focused ECE instructor with Louis Riel Vocational College. Today in Child Development 1 we are going to review Chapter 5 um, which is Physical Development in Infancy and Toddlerhood. You will be watching a video uh, regarding uh, physical development in infancy and toddlerhood. Please do ensure that you are reading Chapter 5 of your text, as this video is not a replacement for your chapter readings. Physical Development in Infancy and Toddlerhood From the textbook, Development Through a Lifespan, 6th edition, by Laura E. Burke Children change physically into toddlerhood. First off, by toddlerhood, the child will be about 32 inches after a year which is 50% greater than at birth. After five months, the birth weight has doubled to 15 pounds. And by a year, the child has tripled to 22 pounds. And what you really must remember is that children grow in spurts and that they don't grow at a continuous rate. Also, there are changes in body proportion. And there are two trends that you need to remember. This is cephalocaudal trend and the proxima distal trend. Basically, the cephalocaudal trend comes from the Latin meaning for head to tail, and basically, it basically during the prenatal period, the head develops much faster than the rest of the body, and basically, the head takes up about a fourth of the total body length, whereas the legs take up a third. Then there's something, the proxima distal trend, it means to grow from near to far. And basically, the child is growing from the center of the body outward, from the head, chest, and trunk, before the arms and legs, and lastly, the extremities as the hands and feet. Then there's something known as the development of neurons. There are about 100 to 200 billion neurons in the human brain. The neuron is this little sucker right over here. Basically, it stores and transmits information. The synapses are this little gap right here that has fibers that um, come close but do not touch each other between the neurons so that they can transmit information. Then there's something known as neurotransmitters and they're these little suckers right here, you see them? They're chemicals that are released by the neuron that sends messages by crossing over the synapse here. You see, and it goes into this receptor right there. Also, with the development of neurons, is once a, neur a neuron is established, they begin to establish their unique functions. So, no neurons do not perform the same function. So, they each perform a different function. Have I said it enough? They extend their fibers to form synaptic connections with the neighboring cells. During the first two years, neural fibers and synapses begin to increase. And that's why you need programmed cell death and synaptic pruning because you need to make room. Basically what programs cell death is, is they die. They make the neurons die because they're making space for the other connective structures between the neurons. About 20 to 80 percent of neurons die during this process depending on the brain region of course. Each area of the brain performs a different function. Where synaptic pruning comes in is it returns neurons not needed to an uncommitted state. So you're not losing the neurons, but it helps support future development because neurons that do not receive stimulation soon lose their synapses, but they can be regained because through stimulation, because we you might need these structures later on. Also, you see something about the development of neurons. You see your little neuron right here. And you see it's surrounded by something called a myelon sheath. sheath. And it covers over the axon. It's kind of like an insulation for your neurons. It's like how you put insulation in your house. 
And basically half of the volume of the brain is made up of something called glial cells right here, which is responsible for this myelinization, which is the coating of these neural fibers that insulate the sheet. And it basically protects your neurons. Basically, this is something known as molding a living sculpture because you are a living thing and it helps mold who you are. Then we have the development of neurons. We start over here. The neurons and synapses are overproduced, so you have tons of them in your brain. And then it starts to make this sculpture through, you know, taking away the excesses like you do a sculpture. You take away all that stuff you don't need which then forms the mature brain which basically what defines the mature brain is a set of interconnected regions each with specific functions then comes the development of the cerebral cortex it surrounds the rest of the brain it is the largest brain structure and accounts for about 85 percent of the brain's weight and contains the greatest number of neurons and synapses First we have the frontal lobe over here, which behind that is the motor cortex, which is responsible for your gross and fine motor functions. Basically things such as walking, grasping, talking, um, and also what you don't see in this diagram. This is the side of the left hemisphere that you see right here. There's something called the prefrontal cortex, which isn't fully developed until about age 25. Between, behind these other ones are the other lobes, but for right now we're going to focus on the front of the cerebral cortex. Basically the development of the, pre, the cerebral cortex is you have something called the prefrontal cortex, which I mentioned is right in front of the frontal cortex. And it controls basically your body movement, is responsible for your thought, consciousness, inhibition, integration of information, use of memory, reasoning, planning, and problem solving. So you notice that this prefrontal cortex is not very well developed in teenagers. And so we see that they don't really think things through. And it's because their prefrontal cortex is not developed. The cerebral cortex is put into two different hemispheres called lateralization. Basically, each hemisphere is responsible for something different. Each hemisphere also receives information from the side of the body opposite of it. So your left hemisphere is in charge of the right side of your body, and your right hemisphere is in charge of the left side of your body. This excludes uh, the eyes because visual information is received by both hemispheres. The left hemisphere is mainly responsible for verbal abilities and positive emotions, whereas the right hemisphere is responsible for spatial abilities and negative emotions. So if you're feeling really negative today, it means your right hemisphere is working overtime. Next, um, is talking about the lateralization of the two hemispheres. Basically, there are studies that show through functional ma magnetic resonance that the left hemisphere is better at processing information in a sequential way. So when you look at lists, your left hemisphere is doing that. Also, because of brain lateralization, we start to understand brain plasticity. Basically, what brain plasticity is means that many areas of our brain are not yet set about what functions they perform. And this enables the brain to learn different things. Even if part of the brain is damaged, other parts of the brain can take over and make up the difference. Also, there's sensitive periods in brain development, and I don't think many people understand this. Children do need a lot of affection and stimulation at a young age. And there are animal and human studies that reveal that early extreme sensory deprivation result in permanent damage and loss of many functions. So if you're not talking to your children at that about two years old, it could impact their motor skills. Because of ethical reasons, though, researchers, researchers are not permitted to deprive infants of normal rearing experiences to observe them. This is completely unethical, so you don't have to worry. There's no babies anywhere that are being ignored. Instead, they have to turn to natural experiences in which they work with children who were victims of deprived early environments. And basically, they do something called a catch-up growth there. And they observe them because they have been through a lot, and so they can. 
but of course they have to have special permission for this. Also, in addition to impoverished environments, ones that overwhelm children with expectations beyond their capacities interfere with their brain's potential. There are schools that claim that they can make super babies and train them to do things, but this is not true. This can actually cause the child to withdraw from stimulation and threatens their interest in learning and creates conditions similar to stimulus deprivation. This is a serious problem. We try to make our kids as smart as possible. We think doing all sorts of things, making them do all sorts of things will make them geniuses. And in fact, it creates an opposite effect. They're unwilling to learn. Also, when it comes to sensitive periods in brain development, there's two different types of growth. First is experience expectant brain growth, which refers to the young brain's rapidly developing organization. And it depends on ordinary experiences. And it has ex opportunities to explore the environment, interact with people, and hear language and other sounds. On the flip side, there's something known as experience dependent brain growth, which occurs throughout our lives. Basically, you're still in that experience dependent brain growth now. And also additional growth and refinement of established brain structures because of specific learning experiences by culture. And basically how this is done is through reading, writing, computer games, weaving, instruments, um, making intricate rugs, knitting, all sorts of things. Next we're going to talk about changes in state of arousal. When we talk about arousal, we're talking about sleep. Basically... Rapid brain growth during those first two years is essential, and basically the organization of sleep and wakefulness is important. The average two-year-old needs about 12 to 13 hours of sleep at night. That's about half a day, at least. And during the middle of the first year, melatonin begins to secrete much greater at night during the day. Melatonin, when it starts to develop, is very important because it promotes drowsiness at night. It's a hormone that does that. And by the end of the first year, as REM sleep declines, infants start to experience adult-like sleep waking schedule. And it usually prompts waking. Um, basically, it's important um, because as you as an adult, you'll start noticing that your child will sleep at night on the same schedule as you, so you're not waking up every several hours having to take care of this child because once you reach two after the first year it, it it's pretty much much easier All right. First, we're going to talk about heredity in this section. When diet and health are adequate, height and rate of physical growth are influenced by heredity. Basically, the, if they are receiving the correct nutrition, they will reach their full potential. They can will tend to be a lot higher. There's even speculation about how back hundreds of years ago, why Americans are much taller than other nations is because we have such good nutrition. Children born in negative environments that aren't se severe, children and adolescents can experience something called catch-up growth. Basically, catch-up growth is once they receive the nutrition that they need, um, their growth path um, return to the genetically influenced conditions. So basically, they can catch up to where they were growing where they are physically. Not necessarily mentally, but there is some catch-up growth in that area. Another thing you need to realize is your genetic makeup also affects your body weight. Not just your height, but your body weight. Children who are adopted tend to be more similar weight-wise to their biological parents than those of their adopted parents. Even though they're living in their adopted parents' lifestyle, they're more affected by their biological parents because of their body weight. It's just how their genetics happen to work out. Another thing you need to take into account is nutrition. It's important, especially in the first two years of life because the baby's body and brain are growing so fast. So without nutrition, the baby's body could either be very stunted or the brain could suffer from mental states. There's also a lot of controversy whether bottle feeding and breastfeeding 
are more nutritious for your child. Of course, breastfeeding is more ideally suited for your child's needs. And even though bottled formulas try to mimic it, it's mostly ideal to breastfeed. And some of the advantages are they provide a correct balance of fat and protein. They ensure nutritional completeness, helps ensure a physical, healthy physical growth, protects against many diseases, protects against faulty jaw development and tooth decay, ensures that it's digestible for the baby, and smooths the baby's transitions to solid foods. Of course, all this is based on how much nutrition the mother herself has. And if the mother itself is not getting enough nutrition in her own diet, it can affect the baby. One of the, another benefit of breastfeeding is that in poverty-stricken nations, it's much more likely to be malnourished in babies, um, and they're 6 to 14 more times likely to survive their first year of life. The World Health Organization recommends all to everyone that they breastfeed until the baby is about two, and they can start adding food, solid foods to the baby's diets when they're about six months old. So you're not just dependent on breastfeeding. A big deal about all of this is malnutrition. About 27% of the world's children suffer from malnutrition before the age of five. 10% who are severely affected suffer from one of two dietary diseases. The first one is something known as marasmus, which is a wasted condition of the body because of a diet low in all essential nutrients. It usually appears in the first year of life when a baby's mother is too malnourished to produce enough breast milk and bottle feeding is inadequate or not even there. The baby becomes painfully thin and is in, in, in danger of dying. As you can see on your right over here is a sketch of a child with marasmus. You see how skinny it is. There's no fat under their skin. It's characterized as having a face of an old man because it has wrinkles, because there's no nutrition there. Um, they're hungry. They have very little muscle and they're grossly underweight. And it's, it's a very sad condition. And it can also cause issues in brain growth too. So there are other factors you have to bear in mind. The second uh, dietary disease is something called Kawashikor, which is caused by an unbalanced diet very low in protein. It's common in regions of the world where children just get enough calories from starchy foods, but very little protein. Um, usually strikes after weaning off of breastfeeding. Um, between the ages of one and three. The child basically breaks down its own protein reserves and it causes swelling in their abdomen like you see here. It's normal here, you know, you see the little child here, and then you see the swelling of the belly. They're not fat, they're just not getting enough protein in their starches. It's where they're getting their calories and it's breaking down the protein in their muscles here and so it causes the swelling. Children who survive these extreme forms of malnutrition will go to be smaller in all body dimensions and suffer from lasting damage to the brain, heart, liver, and many other of their vital organs. A malnourished body protects itself, though. It establishes a low basal metabolism rate, which may endure after nutrition improves. So this could cause obesity later in life because their metabolism is so low. Also, you also need to remember that there's also malnutrition in the United States in, by impoverished families here in the United States because the government supported supplementary food programs do not reach all the families that need it. And about 21% of U.S. children suffer from food insecurity. Basically, what food insecurity is, is it's uncertain access to enough food for a healthy, active lifestyle. So there are many children within our own nation that are suffering from malnutrition. All right, time to get into some real psychology terms here. First is classical conditioning. You hear this a lot in psychology. Classical conditioning is a form of learning where a neutral stimulus is paired with a stimulus that leads to reflexive response. 
Once the child's nervous system makes the connection between the two, the neutral stimulus produces the behavior on its own. Something, a good example would be if a mother were sitting with her child and while she's breastfeeding, she massages the child's forehead and it's just, you know, something the mother does. Well, then once the mother, you know, starts massaging the child's forehead, the baby starts sucking because it thinks it's time for nursing. And it helps the infant know which of what events typically occur together consecutively in everyday life and teaches them to anticipate what is about to happen next. It's a sort of evolution, you could say. Here's a diagram I made. Um, unconditioned stimulus produces an unconditioned response. So then this unconditioned stimulus, when you add it with that neutral stimulus, you know, the unconditioned stimulus, the baby starts sucking once you start nursing it. Because um, the baby starts stuck, sucking up at the unconditioned response. Well, add in that baby, you know, getting their forehead rubbed and the unconditioned stimulus of nursing and the baby will suck. And so what happens is once you start rubbing that baby's forehead, it produces the result of the baby starting to make sucking motions. Next is something called operant conditioning. You see, actually see this in a lot of parenting styles. Infants act on the environment and stimuli follow their behavior, change the probability that the behavior will occur again. The stimuli that affect the behavior are known as something as a reinforcer or punishment. A reinforcer increases the occurrence that the behavior will continue, and a punishment decreases the occurrence of the behavior. And the operant conditioning plays a vital role in the formation of social relationships. You see this type of conditioning a lot in parenting with children. When the child, let's say you're potty training your toddler, and let's say that they're successful in going in the potty and flushing it, you might give them a candy bar and it reinforces the occurrence of that behavior. Whereas let's say the child goes on the carpet, there are some parents that might spank the child or they might say, oh no, you, you don't get any rewards for that or the child could be in trouble. Next is something called habituation. Basically, what habituation is, is basically um, the child becomes accustomed to the environment around them. The human brain is set up to be attracted to novelty. Infants respond more strongly to a new element that is entered into their environment. Basically what habituation does is a gradual reduction of the strength of a response due to repetitive stimulation. So let's say you keep the baby's room the same all the time. Um, but then you introduce something that is a recovery, which a new stimulus is introduced to the environment. So let's say you add a new mobile over the baby's bed. The baby is going to notice that and start to study it. And it increases the responsiveness to return to a very high level. And babies become very aware when you change that environment. And it's actually very good to change their environment very often because it promotes a maximum, it, it, it optimizes their level of awareness and it stimulates them. Habitation research helps us understand how long a baby can remember a wide range of stimuli and it helps us um, indicate their, how high their IQ is or their development uh, DQ is. Another way that babies learn is through imitation. Um, basically by copying the behavior of another person. It might be copying the behavior of another baby or even you and your partner. Scientists have identified specialized cells in motor areas of the cerebral cortex and primates known as something known as mirror neurons, which fire identically when a primate hears or sees an action and when it carries out that action on its own accord. Another thing you need to realize with imitation even though you might perform one action one day, the child might imitate it the next day. And you've completely forgotten that you've performed that action, but that child has learned that action. So you need to be careful what you perform in front of your child because they are learning from you.
Do you remember me showing you that part of the brain that works with motor development? First is gross motor development. It is control over actions that help infants get around in their environment, such as crawling, standing, and walking. And then there's fine motor development, which is the smaller movements such as reaching and grasping, which both of these tie together really well. There is a sequence to motor development. Usually it starts off where uh, the child, when they're held upright, holds their head erect and steady. For, and, steady. and this happens at about six weeks. At two months, um, the child is able to lift self by their arms. Um, by about two months also, they can roll from side to back. So they can kind of roll from their side onto their back and they can't really do much else. By three months and three weeks, they can, are able to grasp a cube, which is interesting that they can't grasp anything else. Um, by four and a half months, they can roll from their back to their side. So, you know, two months ago, they could roll from their side to the back. Well, now they can return back to that. By seven months, the child can sit alone. Also, they can start to crawl. By eight months, they can pull themselves to a stand. Of course, they have to kind of be supported in this, but they can pull themselves to it. By nine months and three weeks, they can play pat cake or peek -a or anything that you want to play with them. By 11 months, they can stand on their own without having to hold on to anything. By 11 months and three weeks, they start to walk on their own. So there's like a three-week difference there between standing and walking. By 11 months and 3 weeks also, they start to build a tower of two cubes. I don't know why there's not another cube in there, but it's a tower of two cubes. By 14 months, they start to describble vigorously. So that's a good time to bring the coloring books. Um, by 16 months, they can walk upstairs without help. Also, they can go down the stairs too. So they'll start crawling down the stairs. You'll see little kids playing on the stairs. By 23 months and 2 weeks, they can jump in place. They can't jump around, they just jump in place. And by 25 months, they can start to walk on tiptoe. Y you think they're going to be really quiet about it, they really aren't. But, you know, your child might be tiptoeing behind you, so you might want to keep an eye on that. Also, these motor skills are put into something known as dynamic systems. Um, a dynamic systems theory of motor development is the mastery of motor skills involves acquiring increasingly complex systems of action. When a motor skills work as a system, separate abilities start to blend together, each cooperating with others to produce more effective ways of exploring and controlling the environment. When a skill is first acquired, an infant must refine it. Something that goes along with that is fine motor development reaching and grasping. By grasping things, turning them over, and seeing what happens when they're released, infants learn a great deal about the sights, sounds, and feel of objects. This is where uh, Piaget's view of the little scientist comes in. First, as a newborn, there's something called pre-reaching. They make poorly conditioned swipes or swings towards an object, but because they don't have very good arm and hand control, uh, they don't really make contact with an object. So if there's a mobile above your baby's bed, they're going to try to swing their arm at it, but they're pretty much going to miss because they can't reach the mobile. Reaching and grasping starts out as gross motor movements and move towards fine motor movements. At about three to four months, infants develop the necessary eye, head, and shoulder control, and reaching appears as purposeful forward arm movement in the presence of a nearby toy and gradually improves in accuracy. First off, there's the ulnar grasp, which is a clumsy motion which fingers close against the palm. So they might not always be able to grab something, but their fingers can usually clench against their palm, and it looks like a little fist. Around four to five months, infants are able to sit up, uh, and both hands become coordinated enough in exploring objects. And this is where the pincer grasp comes in. Infants can use their thumb and index finger opposably to grip things. So instead of using their whole hand to pick something up, they can pick up paper and stuff with their thumb and index finger.
Perceptual narrowing effect is a perceptual sensitivity that becomes increasingly attuned with age to information most often encountered. First is hearing. Between four to seven months, infants can display a sense of musical phrasing. Of course, they prefer like Mozart's minuets because there are pauses between each phrase. By six to seven months, they can distinguish musical tunes on the basis of variation in rhythmic patterns. So old MacDonald, Itsy Bitsy Spider, the works. By six to twelve months old, uh, they can make comparisons between human speech. So they can tell who's talking, they can hear the intonation, they can hear different dialects also. By five months, babies become sensitive to syllable stress patterns in their own language. So when they first start talking, they can't tell the difference between languages. They don't know if you're speaking Spanish, French, or English. Basically, their statistical learning capacity is analyzing the speech stream for patterns, which are repeatedly occurring sequences of sounds. They acquire a stock of speech structures for which they later learn new meanings, and long before they start to talk, at around 12 months. So your child, you know, won't start talking till about a year. Next is vision. A baby's visual word world is fragmented at first. Um, they usually can't really see their first few weeks of life, so they're actually blind. So if a baby, the baby's making eye contact with you, it's not because it sees you, it's just kind of coincident. Um, but their visual world um, becomes is fragmented, of course, because they're slowly beginning to be able to see. Um, by about seven to eight months, it um, starts to go through changes. Visual development is supported by rapid maturation of the eye and visual centers of the cerebral cortex. By about two months, infants can focus on objects about as well as adults can. So you can look at something, and the child will also look at the same object as you. By four months, their color vision is very much adult-like. Um, visual acuity means a fineness of discrimination, so they can start to see textures and motions. And actually, there is a difference between vision between males and females. Females see more textures and detail, whereas males see differences in motion. As babies explore their visual field, they figure out the characteristics of objects and how they are arranged in space. Also, um, they start to develop depth perception, which is the ability to judge the distance of objects from one another and from ourselves. They also start to develop something known as a visual cliff. They refuse to cross over to a deep side, so you don't have to worry about your baby crawling off a cliff, and showing a preference to the shallow side. The infant demonstrates the ability to perceive the depth of something. Motion is the first depth cue in which infants are very sensitive to. They also start to develop the binocular depth cues, which arise because our two eyes have slightly different views of the visual field. So your brain starts to, you know, you, you have two eyes, but you only see one thing. You don't see things double because your brain processes it in such a way that it creates depth cues. And then there's pictorial depth cues, which is something most often used by artists to make a painting appear three-dimensional. Like when you look at cubes and pyramids and things like that. It appears three-dimensional because of that depth perception. All right, and newborns prefer to look at patterns rather than plain stimuli. Um, as they get older, they prefer more complex patterns. Um, partly of this is because they're uh, sensitive to contrast, um, which explains early pattern preference. Um, contrast refers to the difference in the amount of light between adjacent regions in a pattern. If babies can detect the contrast, they prefer the ones with more contrast. So black and white, pick things, you know, opposite the color wheel of each other, and babies will really notice that. Infants tend to search for structure in a pattern stimuli, which also applies to face perception. Babies can tell the difference between faces. Intermodal perception. Um, provides a rich simultaneous input from more than one sensory system. Intermodal perception makes sense of running streams of light, sound, tactical, tactile, sorry, odor and taste information, perceives them as integrated wholes. 
Pabies perceive input from different sensory systems in a unified way by detecting information that overlaps two or more sensory systems, such as rate, rhythm, duration, intensity, temporal synchrony uh, for vision and hearing, and texture and shape, which is for the vision and touch. Within the first half of a year, so the first six months, infants master a range of intermodal relationships. How we understand this perceptual development is through the, a differentiation theory, which it, infants actively search for invariant features of the environment, those that remain stable in a constantly changing perceptual world. In pattern perception, young babies search for features that stand out and orient towards faces. To differentiate means to analyze or to break down something. That does conclude uh, the video for chapter five on physical development and infancy and toddlerhood. Please check in with your instructor if you have any questions uh, regarding uh, the video or chapter as well as uh, to ensure you haven't missed any assignments or handouts related to chapter five. Mm -hmm.